We are beyond borders, which is uh, a tall order for 20 minutes. But what I'd like to do today is, is focus on e-commerce. We have three panelists here with very diverse backgrounds across the public, private sector, shipping, shopping, logistics, banking. We've got a lot of ground that we could cover here. But one common thread that I saw in these three panelists is that they're all on the front lines of the explosion of e-commerce in ASEAN. So I want to talk about that today and frame it first with a statistic that I find pretty eye-popping. But Maybank sees ASEAN e-commerce sales exploding to $88 billion by 2025 from just $11 billion in 2017. So one thing I want to ask the, the panelists to start off, I, I'd like to target their, their work specifically first. Um, and Jim, I'll start with you. I've read your blog on the UPS website, so I'll, I'm going to hold you to something that you've written there. But um, you've quoted your Asia-Pacific president as saying that it's high time to retire the E in e-commerce because you know, this is just the norm now in Asia to, to, to go into the digital space on shopping. So when you look at a statistic like this, um, do, you, do you find it eye-popping? Is, is it really high, too high or too low or about right? Or how would you frame the, the growth trajectory of e-commerce? And, and does something like this uh, surprise you or you think is maybe a little too ambitious? Uh, I, I don't actually think that it surprises any, anyone here in the audience. And certainly it doesn't surprise UPS. Uh, UPS, as an organization, enables global commerce. And of course, we welcome the rise in this type of um, package movement. From enabling e-commerce, um, it is normal business. We, as an organization, relied heavily on business to business, um, outnumbering our business to consumer over the years. And we've seen a shift within that business model itself. And we're now addressing more business to consumer business. Here in ASEAN, between 2011 and 16, the international small package business in ASEAN, as a result of commerce, doubled. And we can see the exponential rate that that grows. And from entrepreneurs um, to Amazon, Alibaba, Zalora, the consumer of today. Uh, is not like the consumer of the past, that the digital technology available to the individual that buys on impulse and has that at their fingertips is a phenomenon of today and will continue tomorrow. We as a business would encourage that type of growth. We would also seek um, to understand that many of these businesses are SME and e-commerce can create choke points in the borders, particularly around ASEAN itself. Um, more could be done from a government perspective to ensure that they train small, medium enterprise. And also, I would say that the governments themselves in ASEAN have done a great job at reducing tariffs. However, they could grow GDP up to six times by increasing the supply chain that allows the movement of those goods across borders and allows the consumer to purchase those goods in a fashion and, and timely manner themselves. As far as the new challenges it creates, um, the choke points I refer to at the borders, as these numbers increase, then governing bodies are having to increase customs officials we have seen the rise as we move through the borders and the packages that are held there as a result of further customs inspections themselves. Mm. And we believe that certainly a relaxation of some of that governance, uh, and later as we continue the discussion, I can tell you how we can do that. That way we can have a more seamless experience for the customer uh, at the end of the day, because when they order the goods, they want the goods. They don't want to be told that they're being held. They don't want to wait three days when they were promised next day. 
You certainly teed up a few issues I hope we can get to in a little more depth in this short time that we have. Um, but to turn to Katya first, uh, if you could also address the, the growth of e-commerce, uh, where you see it, it headed over the next five years, especially with, again, the, the uh, $88 billion we're talking about in 2025. But also I want to add, because I know KBank is dealing with a lot of digital startups, um, helping uh, startups in that space uh, really get the business off the ground in ASEAN. And maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about your partnerships in that regard in the region and where you see the most promise uh, in terms of the new markets out there that are, are really exploding? Um, statistically, uh, the Thai people, I mean Asian first, um, they spend times on the internet in, on average is like 3.6 hours a day. Thai people, 4.2 hours a day. So um, in Thailand, for the I call social commerce, so we are like Facebook, Line, Instagram, those kind of things. They spend time on that social media. And um, the sales for the e-commerce through this channel is like up to like at least one third or half of the sales made on that social media. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of K-Bank, we are the first Thai bank to do the payment, the seamless payment through that channel. Mm -hmm. And um, we hope to, to, to Facebook first. And then um, we hope that, you know, we be able to partner with um, other fintechs more and more. Um, because in our uh, vision, we want to be... Yeah, we want to be the customer life platform. So we want to embed it ourselves in everyday lives of the customers. Mm. So um, fintechs can work with us in many ways. So at least like to provide a seamless experience when they shop online. And also uh, they can help us provide the services through uh, with the cheaper uh, cost, faster, uh, to the customers, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what we do. So, we have a lot of plan to work with startups locally and internationally. Mm. Yeah. Certainly a lot of things, exciting things happening in the fintech space and, and of course the payment systems uh, here in Thailand, of course, yes. uh, really taking off. Santi, I want to turn to you. Um, sure. You've worked for the Thai Finance Ministry, you've worked for the Singapore Investment Corporation. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Now you're kind of in a more uh, private sector and, and digital economy space. Sure. So I'd like to ask you, I mean, when you look across ASEAN, so many exciting things happening in mm -hmm. e-commerce and in business in general. But what do you think policymakers still might have their heads in the sands about mm -hmm. around this space? And what do they need to understand better about the transformations taking place? Yes, yeah, very good question. I think <clears throat> one of the interesting aspects is that when we talk about digital economy, the first thing that comes to mind is disruptions. And policymakers really focus on the digital disruption, displacements of traditional mm. players. In a negative but, way. In a negative way. Yeah. But there's another, which is very true, um, mm. but, but also there is another very inter interesting dimension of digital empowerment. Mm. How you use digital technology to empower the entrepreneurs, the SMEs, the consumers. And they already mentioned uh, you know, the, the, the consumer aspect. Um, our e-commerce platform within C, which is called Shopee, Mm -hmm. uh, is very much uh, e-commerce which focus on what we call C2C, mm -hmm. consumer to consumer. So in instead of B2C, business to consumer, this is a market where we're helping the micro business, the entrepreneurs, you know, you yourself tomorrow could decide, I want to sell beauty products mm -hmm. and get on Shopee. Um, and and, and you know, that's a fast growing um, and also very impactful in terms of helping the small business. Some of the business that may not have happened if they weren't this online channel. Right. One example is that la uh, recently we helped one of the companies within the SME development banks in Thailand um, to help sell uh, uh, products which I think in English would be called pasteurized preserved fish. Mm. In Thai, it's plara. <laughs> uh, for the non-Thai, if you haven't tried it, I encourage you to try it. It's a Thai delicacy. It's quite special. A bit of a quiet taste, but definitely you should try it. <laughs> but in any case, we helped them, and um, you know, from being relatively unknown, they saw 150% growth uh, within just three months um, because wow. we helped them get online. And better yet, once the products become known, 
uh, then they meet a lot of business partners and say, hey, this is a great product. Mm. Um, do you want to you know, export it to Australia? Do you want to export it to Vietnam? And that's what happens. So we start to connect the initial, initial dots. Then you know, that sort of empowerment story go further than that. Mm. Mm. And there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, we have 2 million monthly active sellers mm. now and about 6 million uh, monthly uh, consumers on a platform. And, and, and that's what we live and die by, that you know, our KPI is how many SME did we help and how much can we help them. So really from the ground up, and you're seeing maybe some officials focus more from that high level and maybe not getting as, as so much on the ground that you're, you're talking about individuals even that are starting these businesses and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely the, the, the element of risk, and I, I don't want to underemphasize that. And it's very true for the policymakers to focus on that. But it's definitely there's op huge opportunities about using these uh, digital tools to empower you know, previously what we haven't thought about before. Mm. Another area is on uh, e-sport and digital entertainment, which mm. is about watching people play games. Um, which may not sound that exciting, but it's actually huge, uh, especially in Thailand. We organized Karina World Run of Competition recently, having 240,000 uh, people attend over two days. Right. Um, and, and it's also an empowerment story because Thailand have a lot of creative talents. Potentially, you could groom them to go into game design, esport management, and this, mm. you know, latch on this fast-growing a new industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get the audience involved. Uh, I know you have uh, the mobile app on your phones, if you could, and in this poll. I want to drill a little bit deeper on where within ASEAN we might see the most success in the next few years uh, in terms of the business climate. So the question is, uh, which economy's overall climate for business do you think is the most likely to surprise on the positive side in the next five years? And the choices uh, are the ASEAN six economies. So, of course, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And in retrospect, it would have been nice if I had added some of the others because I, I do, and just speaking to some of you today, uh, you know, there might be some of the other four that um, would be chosen in this. But again, I'm interested to hear thoughts because particularly not which one is the most successful in five years, but which one will surprise. So what will markets and investors, businesses, policymakers all be uh, looking at and thinking, wow, that's, that really uh, turned out well. Uh, so make your votes, um, and we'll, we'll discuss among the panel, too. Oh, here we are. Oh. Okay. Pretty, pretty overwhelming. A little bit of a hometown boost, maybe, for Thailand? No? Okay. <laughs> so Vietnam, uh, kind of the clear winner here in the plurality. Um, if I could turn to the panelists, I mean, thoughts on where among these six economies? Does this kind of seem right to you, and, and does that impact, um, is this in line with what your, your business plans might be for where you'd like to expand, if you can? <laughs> Molly, I, I would answer that question that it's not really a surprise what you see in the screen because it's followed that growth trajectory over quite a period of time itself. And certainly from a UPS perspective, we are seeing significant growth um, throughout ASEAN as well as APAC as well. I think that the one that surprised me here was perhaps the Philippines. Um, I believe that um, as they transitioned into a new government in the Philippines itself, as they improve in the smart city that they're planning to build and investing enormous sums of, of money there, that there's certainly an opportunity within the Philippines over the next three to five years to grow. They have a, a labor work group there. Um, UPS has invested in um, call center activity, uh, growth as far as logistics and freight is concerned there. Um, and of course, Vietnam continues to surprise and continues to grow. Uh, Thailand as well um, surprises me because that is growing at an exponential rate as well. So of course it's a straw poll from the audience members here, <laughs> but from a business perspective, uh, the consumption, uh, the willingness to purchase, whether it be goods from overseas or trade within the uh, ASEAN region is on the up. And for all markets within ASEAN itself, the future looks and appears extremely bright. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of opportunities across mm. these, these six yeah. even, right? Mm. It, it, actually, uh, I probably present a slightly different view from what's seen uh, uh, on, on that map earlier. I actually think that, uh, it's not because I'm from Thailand, <laughs> we always speak in Thailand, but I actually do think that Thailand could surprise on our side. Mm. And the reason is this. First, I think the expectation for Thailand consumption, if you look at the macro numbers and having done macro in mm -hmm. the past eight years myself, 
is, is not that high. You know, consumption is not a, a great story compared to Indonesia, Vietnam. But if you look at the digital side of consumption, it's actually growing multiple times faster than the offline consumption growth. Mm, mm. And what's driving that and changing quickly is three things. One is mobile phone uh, penetration. In Thailand, it's uh, relatively high end in the region. I think it's uh, close to 60% right now. The smartphone. Yeah, I'm saying you the right then, num yeah. number there. <laughs> okay, but yes, it's, it's uh, rising rapidly, uh, access to internet. Second is the, um, what His Excellency, Excellency uh, Minister talked about this morning about the transport connectivity and investments. Mm. Of course, lo logistic part being the important. Uh, part of the ingredient of the e-commerce as well, getting the goods in the hands of customers mm. quickly. Uh, and lastly, the e-payment push, which um, the BOT governor just talked about, the push towards e-payments adoption, which is also rising rapidly. Mm. So these are the three key drivers of e-commerce. So, um, and we are seeing changes uh, happening in all three fronts in Thailand. So in the near term, against uh, relatively maybe mundane expectation, it could be the place, place to surprise on our digital side. Mm. So, Katia, would you agree? Do you share the optimism around uh, you know the hometown favorite here? Or and <laughs> and secondly, I mean, who would be your second choice uh, or maybe first choice for for that positive surprise in the region? Um, in terms of um, ease of doing business, the mm. business climate, I believe that um, every ASEAN country has improved their mm. ranking. So, for example, like Thai uh, from forty. 43 rank to 29 and also the same improve as uh, Vietnam and Indonesia however that ease of doing business even though it's improved however as the there's must be the other index called like um, competitiveness index IMD mm. which um, if you look at in those index for um, every country in ASEAN there's a lot of room for improvement. Mm. So, for example, like there's a separate uh, index in size like economics, uh, performance, government efficiency, mm. uh, infrastructure, and so on. So, sure. if, you know, we want to build the real uh, competitiveness for each country and for, um, you know, uh, business improve the, our ASEAN business climate, so we have to look in all that uh, uh, index. Details. It details. takes a lot to climb up those rankings, right? Mm. Especially yeah, the competition within the region. Yeah, and stand alone as a single country will not have much voice in the global um, arena. So um, together, we, you know, um, can be able to push forward our um, regional agenda. Mm. That's, uh, mm. We have to work together. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm mindful of the time and this ticking clock here, but it's hard to have any conversation uh, around the economy these days without at least mentioning the evolving global trade atmosphere. But I want to kind of turn this on its head. Uh, these, in, within ASEAN, we're not, we're not talking about tariffs or the U.S.-China conflicts. So I won't get into that. But the, within ASEAN, of course, there's a lot happening. Uh, a lot of members uh, party to the CPTPP in the process of ratification, a lot working on RCEP, which has shown progress this year. So I would just ask each of you, from a business perspective, Beyond signing trade agreements, uh, what is at the top of your wish list that governments can address and, and maybe push toward being one market as ASEAN? Or is that still pretty pie in the sky given uh, regional integration challenges? I think that, um, that the governments can work together. I, I see in my short time in Asia, which is only four years, that there's certainly been an advancement through ASEAN um, and collectively trying to pursue uh, a block of excellence. I think that from an investment perspective, whether it be technology infrastructure, the access to technology for people. I mentioned before about backlogs at customs. Introducing blockchain, mm. it gives the customs the opportunity to see what's in the box and would accelerate the processing and clearance of those goods for the end user and the consumer. Um, we're doing a lot here in ASEAN. Some of the world-class airports uh, serve all as, as passengers and also for commerce. Uh, Deep-sea ports that are being created here in Thailand itself give us access by ocean. So we have access by ocean. We have access by air. We need more infrastructure by road. Uh, and that infrastructure by road, when it improves, can then connect uh, each of the ASEAN markets in a more seamless fashion 
rather than moving it through here. More digital infrastructure as well. You're yeah. talking mm. access yes. uh, for, for all consumers. Right? Yes. Anybody else have a... Yeah, no, I, um, you know, when you asked this question, it made me think about, I think more than 10 years ago, uh, how variant economists at Google and Berkeley talk about this notion of micro multinational enterprise, mm. that you can have a very small uh, entrepreneurs, companies that can actually op operate globally or become international trade players. Mm. I think um, that's enabled by e-commerce. Since then, technology has taken a huge leap into mobile and become even more powerful. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, digital infrastructure definitely, uh, e-commerce definitely, that can actually enhance, connect all the firms within ASEAN with each other and allow even the small firms to become multinationals. Mm -hmm. And better yet, the direct the benefits for each unit of export that happens going to go more to the grassroots more directly. So it's also better for equality than just, just GDP numbers. Right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Katia? And um, so in addition to the trade agreement signing, right. the, um, there's um, bilateral uh, of the Thai government, and for example, Thai government and um, Vietnam government mm -hmm. to, Im to improve, to boost, to boost up the trade uh, between the two countries. Within like um, 2020, I believe, um, almost double of the, of the volume. So um, it's like um, put it in action. So after the trade agreement and then some bilateral between government from each country. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. And also it's everyone's issue if we want to make it happen. So it's not the, just the government um, task. It has to be the private sector that have to make it happen also. So as for KBANT, we also signed a bilateral agreement with the uh, private sector in Vietnam and you know, for other countries and other countries to make it happen also.